Mason, thanks so much for joining us. I want to talk about your journey and how you got to Major League Baseball. I don't know how many D3 players make it, especially you in 2017 at Waynesburg. You're sporting a 703 ERA in D3. You get drafted, now you're here as people say one of the premier closers in baseball. Life happens fast, huh? It does, yeah. I mean, <laughs> seven years, but it feels like even less, you know. It's just been a quick kind of shift, you know, a lot of life events. Yeah. And, you know, just playing on this stage, you know, that's every kid's dream. So just savoring it, enjoying it. I'm certainly not going to say you weren't supposed to get here, but were the odds stacked against you in your path? and the choices you made and the opportunities you had, you obviously made the most of them. It wasn't the most conventional path. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, when I was pitching at Waynesburg, my plan really wasn't to be pitching here, you know, so <laughs> pitching in the big leagues. So to, to have it, you know, kind of flip upside down and, you know, take the steps I've made to, to get here has been pretty awesome. And I have seen some of the video and uh, the archives of you. You were a much physically different looking person. And we'll talk about what you found out about yourself and type one diabetes, but uh, you were on the smaller side, let's say, the thinner side, and th that was maybe part of your struggles? Yeah, definitely. I mean, even through high school, it was, you know, I've had the six five frame for yeah. as long as I can remember now. Um, and it's always just been coaches, um, you know, strength, just get in the weight room, yeah. eat more, put yeah. on weight, you know, it's, they were trying it's to help easy, you. you know? And, yeah. you know, it wasn't really from a lack of, of trying for me, you know, I really, that was my goal was to put on weight and you know you always think that those results are going to put you in the best position to succeed on the field so you know I've always had that drive you know it's just a matter of seeing those results at times they would they didn't really come through you realize you have the opposite problem of most people watching us right now they're trying to keep the weight off <laughs> you're trying to but you were trying to put on the smart weight right you're yeah. trying to fill out in the right way so as I understand it and I want you to tell the story you're going to do an internship somewhere and they drug test you. Yeah. And they find out some interesting results. Either they think you're what, cheating the test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you have something seriously going wrong with you. Yeah. How did that go? Yeah, so sophomore year, which was 2018, um, kind of just throughout that season, I'd lost a little bit more weight. Um, I'd gotten up to about 180 pounds. Um, so I'd put on a little bit of weight coming into college in freshman year. Then I started seeing it go the other way. Uh, I lost like 30 pounds. Whoa. Um, so yeah, I kind of had an idea something was going on. Um, but towards the end of the semester in the spring, um, took a drug test for an internship that summer. And they, they thought that my sample, my urine sample was diluted. So I guess that's a common thing that people do to try and Cheat skirt, the test. skirt the test. Yeah. Um, just by like watering it down. Um, <laughs> okay. So good to you know. know. I was pretty surprised when they called, um, but they said that they tested the urine more than they ordinarily would, um, and you can see the blood sugar levels in a person's urine. So I was able to see that my levels were off the charts high. Yeah. Uh, they sent me to the ER, and there I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Wow. So if you didn't find this out, were you? jeopardized I mean yeah. were you was this a health risk for you yeah yeah they said really at the, the level I was at you know I could have been a, within a couple of weeks that I could have went into like a I forget how they, they termed it but essentially a coma just wow. because of, of how high my sugar was and that the body wasn't gonna be able to function at that level that's amazing that the internship and a random drug test led to finding yeah. that out yeah no doubt so instantly what do you do to correct that or how, how does your life change I mean, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is, for a young person, that's that's some pretty ground-moving news. It is, yeah. It was a shock. Um, you know, I really didn't know anything about it. I obviously knew about diabetes, but I never knew the differentiation between type 1 and type 2. Kind of just lumped it all into, yeah. you know, lifestyle, diet, things like that. So, you know, just based on what I was doing, I didn't think that being as thin as I was, that was something that I could, could be diagnosed with. But... Um, you know, went through a bunch of educational stuff in the hospital, um, just, you know, day to day, like, you know, when you eat and then you take a, a dose at night every day as like a basal dose. Um, so really just figuring out the meals, what kind of foods affect you certain ways. Um, so really it's a learning experience, mm -hmm. um, but it's just kind of getting comfortable with uh, looking at a plate, being able to figure out how much insulin you do give yourself. So it's a quick learning experience, but it was a shock for sure.
And so you're getting used to taking care of yourself in, in those regards. And as we kind of fast forward just to today real quick, you've got it all squared away. It's, it's something just manageable in your life. Is that, yeah. is that pretty much what it yeah, is? Yeah, I'd say within probably two weeks, it was, it's kind of just who, part of who you are. Yeah. You, know, you don't really have a choice um, day to day. It's, it's just kind of like you are normal. Yeah. Um, so I think I adapted pretty quickly to it. And you know, being older, you know, they call it juvenile diabetes. There's right. a lot of kids that get diagnosed at a very young age. So I, I felt like as an adult, you know, I was 20 when I got diagnosed. So, you know, I was just in a different situation yeah. where I was able to, you know, learn, comprehend, and, you know, make smart decisions each day for myself and not really have a parent or somebody that had to, you know, kind of monitor that stuff for me, you know, so I felt fortunate in that sense. I forget in this moment right now who it was that you were talking to before a game recently on a road trip. Adam Duvall. Yeah. Somebody who also has yes. type one diabetes. Have you networked a little bit among other professional baseball players to kind of share their stories and uh, share war stories a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I mean, obviously now teammates with Scott Alexander, he's also okay. a type one diabetic. All right. um, Jordan Hicks, Adam Duvall. That's right, yeah. Um, I know Sam, Sam Fold played here and yeah. is now with the Phillies front office. Yep. So. You know, there's a lot of people around the game, in the game, um, that I've met, and it's pretty cool. You know, it's encouraging for me, um, and then also just meeting, you know, kids throughout the world. Um, you know, we're in the process of setting something up with somebody from, I believe, New Zealand. Yeah. So really, it just transcends the world. You know, it affects a lot of a lot of different people, a lot of different ways. Um, so just kind of being in the place I am and having this platform, I think it's a unique opportunity for me. So going back to when you found out and now your life's changed, but maybe physically you're able to put on some of the weight you were trying to, yeah. is that your body changes a little bit? Yeah. And it also allows you the opportunity in, in a weird way for, for most people, 2020 was a tough year having to sit out the entire year. Yeah. That almost kind of plays into your favor that it's a year that everybody's sidelined. You get an extra year, I think, of eligibility. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I had, I pitched in 2019 after I got diagnosed the previous year, yeah. I had a really good year. Yeah. Um, and then 2020 just kind of shut the world down. Yeah. Um, I mean, really for baseball players across the game, it kind of just gave everybody an opportunity to train and right. you know, focus on stuff in a way that you know, we're not really able to with a, a full, full right. bill of games. Right. You know? right. So I think you know, I was able to take advantage of it as many other guys were, but right. getting that extra year eligibility was, was really huge. Yeah. It was another platform to showcase yourself, to kind of exactly, like build yeah. on what you had already mm -hmm. been doing. Yeah. What was it like to get drafted in 2021? It was awesome. You know, I think after I got diagnosed and I had a great year in 2019, um, you know, I was feeling out the opportunities to play professionally. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really know what exactly it would look like. And then being able to go to Gardner Webb and have a, a good year there, um, kind of like you said, another platform mm -hmm. to, you know, get closer to, you know, a lot of guys that are going to be playing professional baseball, whether it's somebody you're playing against or just at that level. Um, so, yeah, just, just getting in there and, you know, focusing on my game and then, you know, going all in on baseball, essentially. That's what, that's what taking a fifth year of school was to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I was able to get my MBA, which was awesome. Um, but you know, that really wasn't the driving force behind it. Um, so yeah, to have, have that, that moment where my name was called, see it on the TV and everything. It was almost like a, a, a relief, you know, cause I, I'd flipped, you know, kind of my plan of yeah. you know, going into the world of, of business, business and yeah. everything. So you know, it was, it was a relief to get drafted, and then I was like, "All right, now it's now it's just focused on baseball entirely." It's yeah. a message, right, to yeah. you? Like, this yeah. is what you're going to do now. Yeah. yeah. What what type of business would you be doing, by the way, if it weren't for this? I studied finance, so I was planning the hospital network, Allegheny Health Network, that I did my internship with. Okay. I'd accepted a job with them. I was going to be <laughs> doing like budget budget analyst and uh, kind of things like that for the network. I think this is pretty good for you too, yeah, huh? Yeah. Pitching I, in Major take, League Baseball. I take this over that every <laughs> no day. No offense for to, sure. to finance and business. For sure. You know, in, in kind of going down the rabbit hole of watching a bunch of old video of you like I did, I've kind of noticed that your mechanics and how you look and operate on the mound, even from when you were younger and, and much much skinnier, um, your mechanics haven't really changed that much. Am I, am I right in that? Or you've, yeah. you've made some changes. I, I've cleaned sure. up some stuff, yeah. tried to simplify it so it's more repeatable. But Looks you like know. you though. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've never, I was never really a guy that did like pitching lessons or anything like mm. that. It's kind of just, I like to throw a lot, you know, long toss or just play catch. And it's just kind of like, you find your natural kind of like what works for your body. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said for that. You know, a lot of guys have unlocked stuff with mechanical changes, but you know, for me, I've always kind of had the ball jump out of my hand. So really not 
trying to stray too far away from that, but just make it a repeatable delivery. So I heard you say mass is gas. <laughs> so I've been I've been drinking a lot of beers, and yeah, a lot of fast food. I've been right. trying to work on my mass. <laughs> I don't think my arm's going to cooperate. So what is, what is that mass is gas? I mean, it, it it sounds simple, but there's probably deeper levels to it, right? Yeah, I, I think just kind of look at it like you know the bigger you are, the more weight you can move, the more powerful you are. You know, we have a lot of stuff here that we're able to kind of measure that and track it through like force plates or strength training yeah um so yeah just seeing those numbers and you know chasing elevating those numbers um year over year you know i've kind of just kind of seen it translate to the field with you know incremental gains in the weight room incremental velocity gains out here so you know it's it's really easy when you have um you know kind of a quantified approach to it yeah and you can can push yourself in a sense where you know it's kind of going to translate. As we record this here in 2024, you're the team's closer, but last year you were starting games and you had a couple really impressive starts. Then the injury happens. It was UCL strain. Yep. I got that right? So that's scary, right? It is. We yeah. usually know what UCL issues turn into. Fortunately for you, it wasn't the surgical procedure. If I remember correctly, you did come back, mm -hmm. made a couple appearances at the end of last year. Um, what was just last year like as a starting pitcher in Major League Baseball? Yeah, I mean, last year was, you know, a great example of the highs and lows, yeah. you know. I mean, obviously making my debut, um, you know, only really two years after I got drafted was yeah. was awesome. Um, you know, and I, I had a little bit of struggle, but I had a couple good starts too. So uh, it was really kind of kind of sad to have it end so quickly and yeah. miss as much time as I did. Um, but I do feel fortunate that I was able to avoid the, you know, long-term surgery you know missing over a year um being yeah. able to get back at the end of last year and pitch at this level again was was super encouraging for me and i think for the organization in general so yeah i feel like i feel like i dodged a bullet there for sure so winter meetings 2023 we're all at, we're all out in nashville david force is talking to everybody and a bunch of different things come up but one of them is and and mason miller we want to keep him healthy next year so we're going to move him out to the bullpen and as soon as he said that bells and whistles and lights went off in my head wait mason miller 100 plus mile an hour fastball that's the closer right there so what was it like for you when maybe there was a conversation about what they wanted to do move you out to the bullpen did closing games instantly come to your mind too uh i mean yeah it's, you want to be a guy that's pitching really just high leverage yeah. um is, is the goal um kind of not knowing how i would take to it you know i just kind of focused on you know, putting myself in the best situation to succeed sure. and then kind of whatever role we needed. Yeah. You know, obviously, just looking at our starting depth, we have a lot more of that than we do down in the bullpen. Yeah. So, you know, I felt like that was going to be not only the best place for me health-wise, but the way I could help help this team the most. Um, so, yeah, to be able to come into spring and kind of pitch myself into that, that role, kind of confirm those thoughts that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people were having about my stuff and how it would translate um, was really good, not only for me, but for, you know, everybody around it. What would ever make you want to go back to starting games again? I mean, you've, you haven't done this for a full season yet, but you've had so much success. Let's call it almost a half season here as, as a team's closer. When you get in there, things generally go pretty well. And a lot of people, I guess, just want to start games. Like, they want to be a starter. Do you ever want to go back? Yeah, I mean... If, if, the, if, if the situation if the situation's it, right, yeah. sure. You know, yeah. I mean, if that's, that's how I'm going to be able to, to help the team win. Yeah. Um, you know, then absolutely. You're not but, opposed to anything, but this is like this feels pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, I feel feel like I've taken to it well. Yeah. I feel comfortable down there. You know, I like pitching in those moments at the end of the game. So, yeah, I, I think you know as as of right now, that that's the role we have have lined up. So it used to be where you knew today might be your day. It's your start. Now it's we'll see who has the lead after six, seven. Start to feel it out. Like I might be going in this game. How are you as a person in the bullpen when it starts to appear like? You might get the phone call. Yeah, uh, I think they, they've always said that you know guys are usually like having a good time, and then it's like get serious, get serious towards the end of the game. And I feel like that's kind of how we are as a group. You know, we have a good time down there. Yeah. Um, you know, through the first couple innings, and then you know, as the starters, you know, pitch count starts creeping up there. Guys start locking it in a little bit. For me, that's usually around the seventh inning. Yeah. You know, start moving around, stretching out a little bit. Um, you know, just get my body ready to go in there. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I don't think you can make the moment too big. You know, you right. don't want to be too too tense. So you kind of try to stay 
stay relaxed, and then when it's go time, it's time to go. So I'm, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, but what is a description of, like, when you make the walk from the bullpen, wherever it is, either here or at a visiting stadium, out to the mound, nervousness, excitement, all the above? What, what is the feeling? I think every, every athlete has some sense of nerves. Um, you know, I mean, for some, some people outside the game, they might call it anxiety, but I think yeah. for, you know, a competitor like us, those are the moments you want to be in. Yeah. Um, it's almost gets you excited. Right. You know, a little bit of nerves is good. So I think it's just, you know, ready to get in the game, ready to go to work. Um, you know, it's the moment you've been, been working for all day. Yeah, and you know what, if, if you weren't feeling something that in that moment, something's wrong with you, right? Like, you're yeah, supposed I'm sure, to be feeling I'm sure there's, people, to be out, I'm sure there's something. people out there, yeah, that, <laughs> that really just don't feel anything. And, yeah. you know, that's probably why it suits the room, the role suits them so well. But, yeah. you know, for me, it's, it's kind of just playing into those nerves and, you know, letting those drive you too. Usually I watch your performances from the studio because we're back in there almost getting ready to do the post game. That's when you're coming in the game. Um, and it's like the same story every time. Here comes Mason, throws some gas, a couple strikeouts usually mixed in. Like your, your outings are almost like predictable. Why can't hitters time you? Uh, I think it's, probably, <laughs> it's one a weird of, question. probably one of the hardest things to do is hit a, <laughs> hit a 100 mile an hour fastball. I mean, 103, have, I think. They have all that stuff that's broken down of right. like how quick you have to react. I think just, you know, the offerings that I have, obviously the fastball and, you know, throwing the slider the way I've been able to throw it this year too. I think yeah. it's just really hard for a hitter to, to be comfortable up there. You know, it's not something that, you know, I'm sure they game plan to face the closer, but it's not the same as, you know, game planning to face the starter. Well, they, they know it's a possibility that when the A's have the lead and it's the ninth inning that you might be in there. I guess if they knew fastball was coming and they could sit on that, if they didn't know if it might be your slider or any other pitches you might throw, um, like these are major league hitters. It, it baffles me that I know it's fast, but if they can hit 97, why can't they hit 103? Yeah, I, I you don't, don't know. know. I'll take it. I'll take it you <laughs> yeah, know. exactly. I, I, I won't search for an answer if I don't have to. <laughs> um, you ever look up at the radar gun? Or do you just know when it comes out of your hand how it feels? From time to time, yeah. I mean, yeah. some places they got the velo right behind yeah, home yeah. plate, so it's yeah. like you can't miss it. Um, you know, but yeah, I think it's a, a good way to measure yourself, you know, if, you know, you kind of leaning on your fastball more if it's coming out or you know leaning on your breaking ball if you're getting good swings on it um but yeah it's it's kind of just a game of adjustments you know you can't get too caught up in you know the number that's popping up on the board you yeah worry yeah. about you know kind of what you're doing with the good. guy in the box it's a good point so tell me if i'm wrong here but last year it seems like you were able to pull 101 out of your pocket pretty easy are you throwing harder knowing that your workload is less as a reliever or a closer it's not really a conscious conscious thing you know I think it's just the like you said the workload mm -hmm. and you know the shorter outings that just kind of let it play up you know it could also be the the moment too yeah. you know yeah. the moment in the ninth inning with right. the one run leads a lot a lot bigger I mean every out's important then but you know the fourth inning you know getting yeah. the third out yeah you know there's just a little bit different of a feel a little different atmosphere around that moment a lot of pitchers in this day and age are going through arm elbow injuries and people have tied a lot of things to you know what pitchers are going through kind of an epidemic whether it's gripping the ball too tight spinning the ball too tight maybe velocity even what things do you do and i say this knock on every piece of wood around here what things do you do to make sure that your arm is healthy as fast as you throw so regularly yeah it's just staying consistent you know i mean this is my body's normal yeah um you know throwing a baseball in general is not healthy yeah you see the pictures of guys arms no yeah. matter how hard they throw and it's not not a movement that you look at and you're like, yeah, that looks that looks good. That looks good. Yeah, you know, you like yeah. that looks like it hurts. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just you know, kind of training your body to to be able to bounce back. Um, you know, we have regular maintenance stuff that we yeah. do: shoulder, arm, um, conditioning, strength stuff in the weight room. So really, it's a number of things. It's just finding a routine that works for you. You mentioned the slider. That's such an important pitch for you because, yeah somebody's throwing 103 and that's all you had maybe it would be less effective the slider what your 1a is that what that is for you i like to think so At yeah 87 I, or so I'd say i have equal confidence in my yeah. fastball and the slider i know that they both make each other better so yeah. you know it's it's silly to sit there and try and ram one down a guy's throat yeah. where you can kind of mix and match a little bit and keep them off balance so it's the, it's the two things it's the deception of they don't know what's coming until it's literally coming their direction but also the difference in velocity at what, 15, 16 miles an hour. 
how do you time that? Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's almost like you have to pick one. Yeah. You know, and that's part of the game within the game is just, you know, what's this guy thinking? What's he looking for? Yeah. What are his strengths? Um, and, you know, just kind of rolling out in that moment what's, what's feeling the best for you. I mentioned the strikeouts earlier and how predictable some of your outings are. I mean, literally, if it's one inning, you're probably getting two Ks. Are strikeouts just the product of, of what you're throwing? Are you, are you trying to strike guys out? Or is that just the swing and miss part about it? I think it's just swing and miss. You, know, yeah. you want to avoid a guy's damage zone. You want to avoid putting the ball in a place where he's going to be able to handle it. Yeah. So, um, you know, in those leverage situations, you don't want to take a chance. You don't want to give a guy an opportunity to hit one over the wall and, you know, tie the game. A couple road trips ago, A's are at Yankee Stadium. You get a couple save opportunities. And not only do you come out there for the bottom of the ninth, ninth um, but you're facing, like, the heart of their order in both times. Is that... So far, has that been one of the pinnacles of this season and, and having that success against that team at that ballpark? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we we pride ourselves on being ready for moments like that. Yeah. You know, Yankee Stadium just has a different, you know, feel than a lot of places. Some of it's the fans, but a lot of it's, you know, the guys on the other side, just kind of the, the aura that surrounds that team. So, yeah, to be able to go in there for us, you know, win two out of four games on the road, yeah. you know, I think – Almost any team up and down the league that goes in the Yankee Stadium and splits right now with the way they're playing, I think they'd be happy. So yeah, we were we were really stoked for it, and you know, obviously for me to have that moment was yeah. was really cool. Sometimes we have the debate in studio when Cots puts you out there in an eighth inning or even a ninth into extra innings into a tenth, and we're like, wait, <laughs> most closers only pitch one inning or three outs in Major League Baseball. You've proven this year. I think nine or ten times you've been out there for more than three outs. I know you'll do whatever they ask. I know you'll do whatever it takes for the team to win. Are you just built for that? Is that why they see you in that role? I think so. I think just my background, as opposed to guys that have been doing that for years and years, yeah. um, just being able to go multiple innings is kind of valuable valuable to us. And, you know, I've always been ready to go back out for another inning. You know, yeah. sometimes there's you get three outs, and it's like, man, I feel good. My stuff looks great. Like, get me back out there. And it's like, is ah. there a, Is there a quick... Chat, wink, nod, cots, or emo, like, yeah. yeah uh, usually I just try to avoid them if I want to stay in the game. But <laughs> Don't cots, let them find you. <laughs> cots will come find me and, and tell me, give you a handshake, tell you you're done, good job, etc. Maybe the last season ever of A's baseball here. Um, what do you think about pitching in the Coliseum? I like it. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff that surrounds it, but, you know, especially this year. Even with the smaller crowds, you know, yeah. the atmosphere at the end of the game is awesome. Um, and, you know, we know the fans are passionate. So, yeah. you know, regardless of how many how many people are in the seats, we yeah. know that, you know, they're, they're cheering for us, they're pulling for us. So, yeah, I, I enjoy it. And, yeah, we're trying to savor these moments for sure. I know this isn't your part of the country and play for the team that drafted you. Do you understand all the, maybe some of the emotions of what's been happening here, what's about to happen here as this season kind of winds down? Do you at least uh, have a grasp on it? Yeah, I think I think we're able to appreciate it. Um, you know, we know the greatness that has happened here. You know, you can look up in the rafters and see, you know, the great players that have played here. Um, you know, the teams that have, you know, performed and won on the big stage on this field. Yeah. Um, and you know, day to day, you might not realize it every day, but you know, that's part of what makes this place special. Um, is kind of the moments that have happened here, and you know, how long the you know the team has has competed and. And worked here, you know, kind of just in the same dugout, same bullpen, yeah. et cetera. So, you know, as a player, that's that's really cool, especially when you get to meet, you know, players like that. We've decided that if you want to be the next Dennis Eckersley, all you really need to do is change your hair. Like, <laughs> well, a little, uh, little, little longer hair, and yeah. then got to work on the facial hair a little bit, you know. So, <laughs> two more quick things for you. What what do you want to do the rest of this season? You got a, you got a nice amount of saves under your belt. I know. There could be an all-star team named even by the time that this show starts airing. Um, do you set personal goals? Do you worry about that stuff? Do you have objectives for you? I think it's important for you to have goals and objectives. Um, you know, you think about longer-term stuff, yeah. and it's like you don't have as much control over that. You have control over today. Um, but, yeah, I think setting goals like that, I think it's every player's goal to be an all-star. Um, but really it's just bringing the same effort, the consistency, uh, and putting together a full season. You know, like, I mean – Guys will have great halves, um, and then kind of fade off as the season goes. Yeah. So it's just just staying staying consistent, staying staying on top of things, and you know trying to stretch this out. Well, to get a first full entire season start to finish this year would be great. Uh, and let's just expand that one last thing: the rest of the career. Are there 
other goals that you've set out to attain? Is it longevity in this league? Is it maintaining a certain something? Definitely. What's in your mind? Yeah, I mean, every player wants to stay here as long as they can. Um, you know, it's you play until the game tells you you're done. Yeah. So, you know, you do everything you can to, to make that as long as possible. Um, you know, every player, every competitor wants to win. Uh, and, you know, obviously a World Series is is the, the pinnacle of that. So, yeah, it's a lot of it centers around winning. Well, it's no longer Miller time. Um, maybe for me, it's actually Miller time. But for you, you got to go play. <laughs> Mason, I appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brody.